Can you see that okay? Yes, right. perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, do you want to go on to the next slide? Okay, so what we're going to cover in the next 20 minutes or so um, is just to go through a brief overview of the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and how that links into patients requiring mechanical ventilation. We'll go through some very brief information about the modes of ventilation and the stages of ARDS and of the processes of when the COVID-19 patients become mechanically ventilated. We'll go through some key terms in relation to mechanical ventilation and then we'll talk through some protective ventilation strategies, PEEP, and also some learning from treating the ventilated patients, which will then lead on quite nicely onto the next talk. So um, in December 2019, um, which I'm sure everybody is very, very aware of, um, a novel coronavirus, which is now named as SARS um, uh, COVID, um, caused a series of atypical respiratory diseases, and it originated in Wuhan in China. And we know that coronaviruses are large enveloped single stranded RNA viruses found in humans and other mammals. Um, and we know that it causes a series of respiratory, gastrointestinal and neurological diseases. And this is to varying extents. So you can see a little bit from the pictures um, on the side, but um, early in the infection, we know that the um, virus targets cells such as your nasal and bronchioepithelial cells and also your type 1 and type 2 pneumocyte cells. Um, and through the viral structure, the protein binds to the enzyme receptors, so your ACE2 receptors. Um, and we know that this, um, this type 2 transmembrane protease presents um, in the host cells, and this promotes um, viral uptake. Um, and kind of uh, and it kind of particularly takes uptake in your um, alveolar epithelial cells, so your type 1 and your type 2 cells. Um, so we know that similar to other um, respiratory viral diseases such as flu, influenza, um, we get profound uh, lymph uh, lymphanemia um, in individuals. Um, and this kind of causes the viral inflammatory response that we typically see. Um, and then this impairs the lymphocytosis and increased uh, lymphocyte apoptosis, so cell death, um, and also causes upregulation of your ACE2 um, receptors. Um, and so we kind of know that you get this acute inflammation um, in the cells itself. And then you start to get um, the kind of damage due to the um, inflammatory response. So as depending on the degree and the extent, but if we're thinking about those patients that are going to present with quite severe respiratory failure, um, you start to get this diffuse alveolar wall thickening, which is very similar to what you see in your ARDS picture. So you start to get um, the alveolar cell itself gets flooded um, with um, edema, you get this influx of your um, monocytes and your neutrophils um, that's causing this um, inflammatory response. And then due to this kind of ARDS picture and this acute inflammation, which I'm sure you've all seen when you've looked at your patients' um, x-rays, you get this bilateral infiltrate appearance. You start to get the endothelial barrier dysfunction. You get endothelial barrier disruption, sorry, and you get dysfunction of your alveolar capillary oxygen transmission. And therefore this impairs your oxygen diffusion capacity. And this is really how our patients present. They present with severe, um, ref refractive um, hypoxia. And this is when the patients require mechanical ventilation. We also know that combined with this, you get your filament activation of coagulation and consumption of clotting factors. Um, and you also get the microthrombi uh, formation. And that's why we know, and what we learned throughout the progression of the first wave, especially, that we get this microthrombi formation and very commonly patients present with um, DVTs, PEs, um, and start to develop um, other severe complications in a smaller minority, such as leg ischemia, stroke, um, and, and myocardial infarction. So if we think about when we see the patients that are presenting with um, the requirement for mechanical ventilation, what we noticed um, very early on is that patients required a significant amount of sedation um, and also a significant amount of paralyzing agents. Um, and therefore, there was the need to have um, complete control over their mechanical ventilation. 
And this was often seen for the first kind of 10, 14 um, days, sometimes even longer in certain patients. Um, that they required very heavy, heavy levels of sedation and therefore required complete mandatory ventilation. Um, and this is in kind of two parts. One, um, to help provide a time of lung rest and provide adequate gases exchange, but also with the high levels of sedation which was required in the control of ventilation, you were able to reduce the patient's respiratory drive with sedation and therefore allow for periods of lung rest and ventilation strategies, which we'll go on to later. So common modes of ventilation that um, you may see your patients on in the early stages is more your SIMV, so your synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. And this may be seen in volume control or in pressure control. Now in the UK, we do favor pressure control ventilation, um, but I know it does vary around the world. But quite often what we saw was that we would potentially try the patients on a pr pressure control mode of ventilation and then we were still having a lot of problems with maintaining adequate gas exchange and maintaining normal hemostasis with a normal pH. And therefore um, we had to try other modes of ventilation. So with SIMV volume control, it gives mand mandatory volume control breaths, um, but the patient can trigger within a trigger window. And therefore if the patient does trigger a breath then they get delivered a pressure support breath. So your spontaneous breaths are additional to the set respiratory rate. Um, and with SIMV pressure control, um, the difference is that it delivers mandatory pressure control breaths. Um, and, but the patient, again, can still trigger within a set trigger window um, and spontaneous breaths are delivered with pressure support. So you may see two various different respiratory rates because your spontaneous breaths are in addition to your um, set respiratory rate. Um, and this is commonly the mode of ventilation that you would see um, in the early phases. Um, and we tend to use pressure control modes of ventilation because um, of the concerns with um, high peak airway pressures um, and um, because these patients became very difficult to ventilate in the early stages. And then hope, hopefully, depending on the progression of the patient, um, after that initial maybe one, two or three weeks, we were able to try and wean off their sedation. And um, once you start to wean off their sedation, you start the weaning process with their ventilation. Um, and then what you may see your patients go over onto a different mode of ventilation, which would just be pressure support. Um, so pressure support uh, ventilation is purely patient initiated, although you do set um, a um, backup mode just in case if the patient doesn't trigger a breath. Um, and it delivers a pressure support in addition to a set PEEP. Um, and as I said, a backup mode can be initiated. Um, and what the main um, part of this is here is that depending on the, how difficult the patient is to ventilate, it will depend on what level of pressure support um, you would require to give to the patients. If the patients no longer require additional pressure support to augmentate their tidal volumes, and potentially depending on the weaning strategy, patients may be go on to CPAP. Um, so CPAP again is patient initiated and there's just a set PEEP. Um, so there's no additional pressure support as the patient triggers a breath. But again, as the patient, um, if they fail to trigger a breath, again, a backup mode um, will be activated through the ventilator. And often when patients, if they required artificial airways, um, once they'd had a tracheostomy, for example, then it'd be a process of weaning them off of pressure support. So if we think about just some key terms, which I think will be really important, um, apologies if this is not um, new information, but I think it's important for everyone to get onto the same level. Um, so some key terms to remember when we're thinking about the ventilation strategies of patients, not just in COVID-19, but it's especially important in patients with COVID-19. Um, so if we think about your lung compliance, so your lung compliance is basically a measure of the elasticity and the expandability of the lungs, but also bearing in mind the lung and the chest wall as well. Um, and it basically is a measure of change in volume over change in pressure. Excuse me. And it can be affected by um, your posture, um, various different lung conditions, uh, positioning of the patients and also surgical complications. And a normal compliance, which is measured on a ventilator, is about 50 to 70 mils um, per centimetre of water. 
And we know that as your lung compliance decreases, that means the patients are more difficult to ventilate. And usually we use the cutoff of about 20 um, to say that the patients have got quite severe ALDS and are very difficult and have very stiff lungs. Um, and we usually measure your static or your dynamic compliance. Um, so your static compliance is measured under static condition, conditions. So what that means is basically a condition of no airflow. And therefore, if you eliminate your airflow, then hopefully you eliminate your factors of resistance. There may be times where you may see increased compliance in patients. That can be seen in patients with emphysema. Um, and I think what we noticed in the COVID-19 patients is some patients have very um, low compliance, which is what you would expect in your ARDS population. But actually, some patients did um, actually, although they had quite severe hypoxia, their lung compliance was actually relatively normal. And then if we go on to resistance, um, so resistance is basically what your opposition is to gas flow. And it's the resistance in the tube that delivers air from ventilators to the lungs. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and if you get, for example, a partially blocked tube, you'll therefore require high um, airway pressures to deliver the given volume of air, and therefore your, air, your resistance will go up. Other causes of increased um, resistance are bronchospasm, um, and you can commonly see it on sputum retention. I remember um, going in to see a patient um, who was becoming particularly difficult to ventilate, and his airway resistance was very high, um, and his PKO pressure suddenly rapidly gone up as well. Um, and then when we realised when we couldn't pass the suction catheter, we realised that actually potentially the um, uh, endotracheal tube had become narrowed. And this was quite commonly seen, um, as we'll go on to talk about later in the day, um, in these COVID-19 patients. So a normal resistance is between 10 to 15 um, centimetres of water. So some key important information, um, and this comes from all your seminal ARDS management work, um, is to think about the idea of protective lung ventilation strategies. <clears throat> And this study that you can see here on the, on the page is um, some very key information that was done in the early 2000s um, to compare what was conventional ventilation with low tidal volume ventilation. So we're trying to provide adequate lung rest. Um, and this seminal work <coughs> compared um, six mils per kilo of ideal body weight um, tidal volume ventilation to 12 mils per kilo of um, ventilation. And um, they found that the lower tidal volumes resulted in higher survival. So there was a 22% lower 28-day mortality rate and a significantly more ventilated three days and a lower incidence of non-pulmonary organ failure in the um, intervention group. And actually, because of the significant um, differences between the groups, the trial was actually stopped early um, because it obviously was proven obvious that we needed to ventilate patients in this way with um, because of the significant lower mortality in the lower tidal volume group. And that's when we started to think about the idea of lung protective strategies, or you may hear it called baby lung strategies. Um, and the idea is to provide a lower tidal volume um, to allow for hopefully bringing your airway pressures down and, allow, and prevent that cyclical um, ventilator induced lung injury and hopefully provide lung protective ventilation strategies. Because we know that even if even if you have very consolidated or very stiff areas of lung, putting more pressure in is not necessarily going to aid the ventilation of those lung units. Potentially, you're just going to over distend um, the, the healthy alveoli that you actually currently have, and therefore you'll just um, potentially just, um, do more damage at that stage. <clears throat> and then, so going alongside um, protective. Um, lung ventilative strategies, we know that therefore you have to allow for an element of permissive hypercapnia. And permissive hypercapnia is controlled hypoventilation, so your low tidal volume ventilation, which comes alongside protective lung ventilative strategies. So you accept hypercapnia um, to avoid preventing um, further injurious injuries to the lungs. We know that hypoxemia is a major life-threatening condition, um, but permissive levels of hypercapnia um, is not. Um, but 
saying that we do have to consider a modest permissive hypercapnia um, because you do have to consider your normal body's hemostasis with your um, level of um, your pH and your acidosis, as we know that worsening acidosis can have a detrimental effect um, on organ dysfunction. I'll just skip that slide, Rachel. Thank you. So I think a really important fact and a very important learning fact that we had um, during um, our first wave of COVID um, from March this year is that initially we thought that what we would need to do with your um, PEEP, so your positive end expiratory pressure, was use the strategies that come through the ARDSNET protocol of high PEEP and escalating your PEEP and requirements based on the level of your FiO2. And this came again from some quite important work through the ARSNET trial um, of allowing for a level of recruitment. <clears throat> um, and obviously we used the idea of PEEP alongside proning, which we know was very beneficial in these patients. Um, so the idea behind this study was that as your PEEP escalates and goes, um, increases, that you will need to escalate and increase your levels of PEEP. Um, but this is what we've come to realize is very dependent on the recruitability of the lung units. And it's very much, you need to, it's not a one size fits all. Um, and actually what we found in um, some of our COVID-19 patients um, was that, um, as I said earlier, although they presented with severe levels of hypoxemia and, um, were on the ventilator with very high FiO2 requirements, potentially they actually presented with normal lung compliance when we were looking at their ventilator requirements. Can you go on to the next slide, Rachel? Thank you. <clears throat> so it, we almost seem to think that COVID-19 pneumonia seems at times divergent from ARDS, typical lungs, which we'd seen in the past. And this um, is a research letter that was published um, this year that showed that actually not all patients responded to high levels of PEEP. And this was definitely something that we, we noticed within our centres um, in clinical practice. Um, and it was actually, we noticed that some patients just weren't tolerating the high levels of PEEP. Um, and when we had a look at it in more detail, we realised that actually some of the patients were presenting with low compliance, but not necessarily as low as typical ARDS lung um, presentation patients. And when we looked at their ventilator, we realized that the high levels of PEEP was potentially making them um, gas trap um, and therefore not getting adequate expir um, expiration. Um, <clears throat> and therefore we thought that maybe a lower levels of PEEP um, might be more optimal. And it seems that this was also um, presented in other, in other places as well. Um, we also noted um, that um, because we know that increasing your PEEP too high can sometimes lead to an increase in your dead space. Um, and then if you get an increase in your dead space, um, you do actually get an increase in your transpulmonary pressure, um, which then um, you're kind of forcing, and that increases to your um, increase in your pulmonary vascular resistance. <clears throat> um, and therefore, if we are giving two level highs, high levels of PEEP, when your lung compliance is potentially normal, um, then we know that your alveolar pressure is, is transmitted to the pleural pressure. And I think what this study shows quite nicely is also that too high PEEP was actually worsening patients' hemodynamics. And you can see that actually by decreasing the PEEP, <coughs> you can see that their um, noradrenaline requirements came down. Um, so the requirement for vasopressors um, and their mean arterial pressure increased. Um, and they weren't requiring fluid balance um, and the fluid resuscitation that was initially thought was because the patient was presenting with quite severe um, uh, uh, re reduction in their blood pressure. So I think just to kind of talk about what we noted, and this will go on to the, the following talk um, coming after mine, but we learned from our colleagues um, initially in March who were presenting in their first waves before I was in the UK um, that COVID-19 was going to be a relatively um, non-productive process, that these patients were going to be incredibly unstable um, and potentially the role for um, respiratory physio and sputum clearance wasn't necessarily going to be required. And I know this isn't necessarily what was noted around the world, um, 
Um, but what we noticed in the UK was that <clears throat> actually some of our patients started to develop really thick, um, very purulent secretions. And that seemed to be around kind of day four, day five, day six. Um, they started to actually have an increase in their sputum uh, load. Whether this was because of the kind of superimposed pneumonia on top of the COVID-19 inflammation, but also we had a very, um, <clears throat> a very cautious approach to humidification initially. Um, and I do wonder if that played a role in it, but obviously if we go into further pandemic, sometimes availability and availability around the world of humid humidifying ventilated patients. Um, so it's definitely something to um, consider in the ventilated patients. As I said earlier, when I was talking about resistance, we definitely noticed a lot of episodes of um, blockages of the endotracheal tubes. And what this presented like and what the values you could see on the ventilator was that it often happened after acute and profound desaturation following patient coughing. Um, we then noticed an inability to fully pass the suction catheter through the endotracheal tube. And when looking at the ventilator screen, we noticed that if they were in a pressure um, or a volume mode of ventilation, their tidal volumes were dropping or you're seeing an increase in their peak airway pressure, their airway resistance was going up and their lung compliance was going down. And often we noticed this required kind of immediate medical attention and patients required immediate change of their endotracheal tubes. <clears throat> um, and also we did notice um, we were using a lot of heat moisture exchange and filters through our ventilator circuits. Um, and we did go through a, a significant number of these and, you know, normally in ventilated patients, they may be changed once or twice a day. We were often seeing patients going through 10 to 12 um, HMEs in one day. So noting these were needing to be significantly increased and changed because they were getting fluid filled and that was again affecting um, their ventilation. So that's just some kind of key signs to look out for um, when you're with a ventilated patient. So <clears throat> just a few conclusions before we go over to some questions. Um, so COVID-19 pre presentation varies significantly. Um, from patient to patient, but we did have high numbers of patients who did require mechanical ventilation. As I said, these patients required very heavy levels of sedation and paralyzing agents in the early stages, and therefore we had prolonged use of mandatory control ventilation um, versus assist or pressure support ventilation, depending on the staging and the time of presentation. We also learned that likely the um, presentation was not always in typical ARDS, um, which is what we initially thought patients would present with. I mean, we definitely did have patients that did present with severe, very stiff, very poor lung compliance, and often they had to go for um, ECMO. Um, but actually other patients and a moderate number of them um, actually although we're presenting very hypoxic, did have um, normal or just slightly lower levels of lung compliance. We also know now that um, there will be an optimal level of PEEP for patients, um, and this may be lower than what you'd be originally expecting, so maybe in the range of 8 to 12. Um, and this is likely lower than would have been traditionally recommended in your average ARDS patients. Again, we haven't really deviated from the no that we know that um, protective lung tidal volume ventilation or lung ventilation strategies are key and important in these patients and I think it is very important and what we learn is that regular physiotherapy review to optimize airway clearance and airway patency um, is really important as we did have multiple incidents of airway occlusions um, and difficulties in ventilation um, but that will go on to the next talk to talk about uh, the mechanical ventilation of the um, intubated and ventilated patient. So thank you. So, Vicky, thanks so much for your talk. We've got a couple of questions coming in. The first one, and you've, you've briefly touched on this, is how long on average were your patients ventilated for? I think what we noticed in our centres is we had, especially in the first wave, I think it's probably a bit too early to say in, unfortunately, we are going into what seems to be a second wave here um, in London, but patients were ventilated for a long period of time um, and they were requiring heavy sedation. And I mean, really heavy levels of sedation and paralysis for much longer than would typically be seen in a flu or pneumonia patient. 
Um, so I think it's, you know, I would say the minimum time someone was ventilated was probably about um, 10, 12 days. And we actually had patients who were mechanically ventilated um, for, you know, um, a significant number of months. Um, and I think because in the early phases, we were very cautious about providing um, tracheostomies because of the risk of the AGP. I mean, a lot of lessons have been learned from that and there isn't the precaution that everything has been set up now. Patients were remaining ventilated for, for, for much longer than would be normal in your units, I would say. And you mentioned about the blockages of the HMA fillers. I think that's certainly something in the UK a lot of people found because we weren't using humidification initially and we underestimated the secretion load of the patients um, and probably some degree the after effects of the inflammatory stage of the virus which um, obviously caused infection as well we've seen a lot of like um, you know coexisting infection in these patients and that's when the physio came in so one of the questions is around timing for physio obviously respiratory physio in the UK especially in critical care we you know we have a very solid foundation and it's different in some of the other countries but what kind of things were you know we'll move on to this in the physiotherapy talk what kind of things were really helpful from a ventilation point of view like did you see a big difference in ventilation status once you'd been um, involved with these patients oh Vicky you're just on mute <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think we did. Yeah. Um, as I said, we we really didn't think that physio would need to be involved in these patients. Um, but we were getting um, then rapidly called to see these patients by our um, MDT colleagues um, because they'd had profound desaturation. As I said, it often happened with rolling or if the sedation was slightly lighter than they'd been coughing, um, which I think we did also see in our self-ventilating patients if they had severe coughing fits. Um, but I think they were they were very um, unstable um, and but and often they would sometimes deteriorate a little bit um, before they got better. But after we had started routinely seeing these patients, sometimes they needed seeing every day. Um, some patients were needed to be seen twice a day from a chest physiotherapy point of view. And um, I know that that's going to be discussed, the kind of treatment strategies in the next talk. So I won't go into that. Um, but. Yes, we were then noticing that there was improvements if we were um, able to clear some of the secretions because, as I said, it was incredibly tenacious, it was incredibly thick, and it was definitely plugging off um, patients' lungs. So I think because of that balancing instability, they did sometimes get a little bit worse before they then got better. Um, but we did notice definitely an improvement after airway clearance. So there was a lot of talk around potentially like high frequency oscillation ventilation at the very beginning um, when we first encountered these problems. And I know some centres did even try it. Um, what did you have any experience of that? One of the one of the questions is just around oscillation therapy, but if we link it to ventilation. So um, we don't have high frequency oscillator ventilators um, where I work. Um, and I know that a few centres do, but a lot don't. Um, so, I mean, I don't have any experience, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if you do, Rachel. Um, so where I was, we definitely didn't have access to or use. Um, I know a couple of centres tried it, and for choice of better words, not as a last-ditch attempt, but just because the airway resistance and compliance was so bad, mm. and proning hadn't been that effective. With those patients, we generally found proning was really beneficial which is the next talk um so a lot of it was riding the storm a lot of it was just keeping the patients like medically stable um and accepting you know higher levels of co2 like you've said um are you know much higher than we would normally allow in permissive hypercapnia and also with the um with the you know um hypoxia as well and the prone was used repeatedly I think the proning was used for much longer lengths of time. And I know sometimes because we had therapists involved in the proning teams that you would go to reattempt to supinate the patient again and they maybe tolerated that slight turn onto their side and then they massively desaturated. So often we had to flip them right back again into proning and they didn't have their supination time. Mm -hmm. um, because as you say, we were, they were so profoundly hypoxic even on their front they just didn't tolerate turning onto their back so it definitely was a 
And I think because everybody was learning it in March, weren't they? You know, we were all, it was thrown on us almost overnight, it seemed like. Um, I think, you know, I don't think there was any harm in trying different strategies. Um, but I think what we know now more about PEEP, um, and I, obviously we know the evidence around high frequency of ventilation in adults anyway, um, you know, I would suggest potentially it's not the best strategy. Um, but again, I don't think there's any reason it has a last ditch, as you say, a last ditch attempt to necessarily trial it. Exactly. And I think the, the big thing with any of the novel modes of ventilation, certainly in the UK, is that we don't tend to use them unless someone has good experience with mm -hmm. them. So these were the centres that would be either, you know, routinely using those novel modes of ventilation for um, certain patient groups whether they be very specialist patient groups or, you know, patients who were um, on ECMO, for example, because um, we're very fortunate to have, you know, um, ECMO here as well. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Well, I know ventilation is such a massive topic and it's done with such varied practice all around the world, but Vicky's more than happy for you to reach out to her either on social media or if you just DM me, we can give her your email. But thank you so much, Vicky. And all before your shift as well like <laughs> so much after a night shift i can go home now so that's good <laughs> have a okay. good rest of the day everybody bye-bye see you later thank you now i am delighted that this next speaker um alex is here now alex i am just going to ask you to quickly try and share your screen because it wasn't working before so we might just have to log out and then log back in Okay, no problem. Can you hear me as well, Rach? We can hear you perfectly. Good morning, everybody. Right, it says you've on. disabled screen sharing. Right, let me just check now. Try again. <coughs> yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, okay. So I'm delighted to welcome Alex with us today. She'll introduce herself but she's going on to the second talk of today um, and then we will have a short break. Don't forget, please put any questions in the chat or just DM me. Thank you so much. Over to you, Alex. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you've had an excellent first uh, session um, and hopefully I'm going to follow that up with some physiotherapy techniques. Um, I'm an advanced physiotherapist in critical care up in the northeast of England in Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, I've worked in critical care for quite a few years now um, and I absolutely love it. So um, also I've popped my Twitter handle on there, more than happy for anybody to get in touch via Twitter um, if you have any questions um, or want any support following this talk as well. So what we're going to cover in this session is the physiotherapy role in secretion management in patients with COVID-19, positioning, manual techniques, suction, ventilator hyperinflation and prone ventilation. So quite a few things to get through. So first of all, we're going to, I'm just going to sort of highlight why physios do need to be involved with these patients. So these are some pictures that are taken from Twitter um, and they quite clearly show a patient's ETT tube. So um, the endotracheal tube that is completely clogged with secretions. Um, COVID-19 tends to start with a dry cough, but it has been found in certain groups of patients who have had prolonged periods of ventilation that thick, you know, very thick, as you can see from those images, dirty secretions are tending to block up the ET tubes. This can be multifactorial. Patients are often on very high levels of sedation, um, so they won't be coughing, and um, so that can lead to problems. Also, um, Initially, there was issues with using humidification in these patients. And um, so we weren't using the normal humidification strategies that we usually would. So there was quite a few incidences of, of tubes blocking because of that. However, in the UK, we have now moved to using um, humidified circuits again, but I'm aware the practices may be different around the world. So just be aware of the impact of lack of humidification with your ventilated patients. 
Also, an another reason that sometimes these tubes become blocked is um, as the patients are heavily sedated and needing high amounts of ventilatory pressures um, and support and high levels of oxygen, they're sometimes not repositioned as much as usual. And we all know that moving around helps move that phlegm around. So that can be another reason for blocking those tubes off. Okay, so just sort of to help you think about the type of patient that as a physiotherapist, you might get asked to see. I've just got a little case study here. So it's a 59 year old male who's COVID positive. He's been on intensive care for 12 days. He's been intubated and ventilated and there is, there, put my teeth back in, the ventilatory strategy that we use in his lung protective ventilation. Um, he finished a course of pronin three days ago, um, and we're going to talk about pronin in a little bit, so don't worry about that too much. In his background, he's got type 2 diabetes and hypertension. These are two um, very common risk factors, um, and also this gentleman's age as well for COVID-19, and quite... Um, these patients are tending to need a lot of support that fall into these risk factors in this bracket. On chest x-ray, he's got bilateral infiltrates in a pattern with the RDS, but this has been improving, probably as a response to the pronin. And clinically, he's showing signs of a ventilator-associated pneumonia. And the nurses let you know that the patient is due for a sedation hold at 10 a.m. So you're asked by the nurse um, to review for chest physio because the patient's dropping their SATs and their pressures are going up. So hopefully you can see that chest x-ray on your screen. I know they don't always come through amazingly on um, these kind of platforms, but hopefully you get a picture of what the type, what a chest x-ray of these patients might look like. So our patient, as we said, he's got an endotracheal tube in situ. It's being ventilated on SIMV, which is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. So this is a volume control, usually a volume controlled mode of ventilation. Helps you ensure you're getting those small tidal volumes into the patients. And you can restrict the pressures as well by having a top pressure alarm. Is being ventilated with a PEEP of eight and is currently on 45% oxygen, but that has increased from 30%. His SATs are 87% and his entire CO2 is 8. So we know that that looks like it will have been trending up. So his blood entidal CO2, uh, blood entidal, his blood CO2 will be going up as well. So on auscultation, you can hear coarse expiratory crackles. On palpation, there's tactile phrematis and reduced expansion. And the nursing staff are reporting that he's not coughing. Again, this not coughing element of these patients is is you know, very, very heavily reported and very, very common. This is because the patients have had loads of sedation as well as paralyzing agents, and it can take quite a long time for those to go out of the system, especially if they've had multiple episodes of pronin. And um, so that kind of tells you that if there are secretions there, which, which from a really good assessment, it, it seems that there are, it's going to be tricky for the nursing staff to get those up. So his blood pressure is 134 over 85, heart rate 102, so he's in sinus tachycardia, and he's not cardiovascularly supported at the moment. He's sedated and paralyzed, so he's on propofol and atricurium. So as I said, these patients do have high sedation and paralyzing agents. Um, and also his temperature is spiking at 38.2, and his white cell count is rising. So as I said, this is a relatively typical picture of the patients with COVID-19 that we've been coming across in the UK quite regularly on our intensive care units. Okay, so the first thing that we need to think about doing is optimizing this patient's position. So we know that there's a lot of secretions on the right side of the chest. That's what we're hearing and that's what we're feeling. Um, so it is probably worth us turning over the patient onto his left side to help re-expand that right side and um, help with some secretion drainage and it also improve our VQ matching. A good time to do this is to try and coordinate with the nursing staff because these patients will be needing to be turned every two to four hours for pressure relief for their, their skin and everything. So it's really important to try and join our um, interventions together. So to try and match that up with when the nursing staff um, are hopefully needing to do a turn as well. So 
The added bonuses of doing that is that you're going to have sufficient staff available. You're going to kill two birds with one stone. So you're going to help the nursing staff and the nursing staff are going to help you. You're going to optimise the patient's position for your physiotherapy. And hopefully the patient can then um, stay on that side to get the longer term benefits of being repositioned. Other things to think about in these patients are their cardiovascular stability. So he's unsupported. This particular case study we've got is unsupported, but some of these patients might be needing um, agents to manage their blood pressure. So just be aware of that. Um, and they also may need um, pre-oxygenation as well. Um, this patient's on 45% oxygen, so not too high, but if it was somebody on significantly more oxygen, you may want to turn that oxygen up before you move them because these patients have been found to desaturate really, really quickly. Um, so pre-oxygenating them to prevent that happening is always the safer thing to do. And as I said, you need to think about your staff availability. So you're going to need your nurse and staff. You might also need a colleague, a physiotherapist, colleague to help you with your second round of treatment which we're going to go on to now. So once you've optimised the patient's position, manual techniques can be really useful um, for helping to move those secretions up and out into those more um, proximal airways so that we, that we can then clear them. And because the secretions are very, very thick, the patient isn't deep breathing or coughing or moving about, we are trying to replicate that and um, sort of and replace that by using our hands to manually move those secretions. So you would want to do this with the patient in their left side line, as we've just done. And you want to target where you can feel those palpable secretions, so that right upper and middle zone. And I'm hoping this video is going to play. So we've just got a little video here of this is a physio doing some um, fibs as we call them vibrations to the patient's chest so as you can see as the patient breathes out the physiotherapist is applying a downwards um, pressure and also a shaking pressure so with her hand she's doing this kind of movement so hopefully you can see that there in the video I'll just play that again for you oh no I won't try again Hopefully that's playing again there now. So this is a really useful technique that can help to move and mobilize those secretions up into those higher airways so you can then hopefully suction them out. Because these patients aren't coughing, also another technique that can be quite useful is a manual assisted cough. We tend to use this in combination with suction. So this is when you're going to need your second pair of hands. Also your fibs, we would do that in combination with suction as well. So you might do um, rounds of fibs and then you might do vibs as somebody suctions if that doesn't work then also you might want to add your manual assisted cough so manual assisted cough is an upward and firm um, pressure applied to the diaphragm to kind of replicate that movement and um, to help assist a cough there are quite a lot of videos online I couldn't fit both onto this slide and um, it just wouldn't work but if you have a look online for manual assisted cough especially with spinal cord patients there's some really good videos to show you that um, and that can be really useful when patients aren't coughing like this patient because of how heavily sedated he is. As I said, you're looking at combining these techniques with suction and also with ventilator hyperinflation. So ventilator hyperinflation is a really useful technique where you essentially perform deep breathing exercises or, or active cycle of breathing on a ventilator. So what you're looking to do is increase the tidal volume that the patient is receiving. So therefore you're replicating the patient taking a nice big deep breath. So in that video that we just saw, the patient was being instructed to take a nice big deep breath. And as the patient breathes out, that's when the physiotherapist supplied those um, vibrations. I'm doing it with my hands all the time while I'm speaking. <laughs> So um, because this patient is heavily sedated, we can't get them to take a nice dip, big deep breath. So we could do that manually for them. So to do that, we, you know, would increase the target tidal volume on the ventilator, or if they're in a pressure control mode, we would increase the pressure, the pressure support that we were giving the patient. 
So there are some contraindications to this technique. So undrained pneumothoraxes, severe bronchospasm, somebody with a head injury with an ICP over 25, severe, severe hypotension, and also a subcutaneous emphysema of, of unknown cause. Once you've identified that it's an appropriate treatment and, and there's no contraindications, you want to identify what target tidal volume you're going to look to achieve. So we usually aim to achieve um, 1.5 or 50% greater than the baseline tidal volume. So it's really good to make a note of where you are before you start and then um, think about where you want to achieve to and then gradually increase either the pressure or the volume control until you reach that um, target tidal volume. Before you start altering the pressures or the volume on the ventilator, it's really important to optimize patient's position because you want to get this extra ventilation into that area that you're really trying to target. So in this patient, that's the right upper lobe. So we want to, as we said, be in left side line. And as we give those bigger tidal volumes, that um, ventilation is hopefully going to go to the area of least resistance, which is the uppermost lung. So hopefully we'll go to that area and re-expand that right lung, get some nice big air into there and hopefully as well mobilise and move those secretions up and out into the upper airways. Always with any of these patients that are COVID-19 um, positive, it, when doing any of these techniques and um, the VIBs that I mentioned before and anything that I talk about from now on, you must make sure that you're done in appropriate PPE before you do anything. So um, again, that's slightly varied around, around the world, but definitely full gown, gloves, mask, which is a, a full FFP3 mask and a visor as well. You want to be protecting yourselves as, as much is making the patient better. So as I said, what then you would increase your tidal volume or your pressure control to achieve that um, target volume that you were aiming for. One thing to just be aware of, you wouldn't want the pressure to go above the P um, in the P uh, max, sorry, to be above 35 centimeters of water. So you just want to keep an eye on that when you're increasing that tidal volume that it isn't going above that that absolute maximum limit of 35. Then your additional options um, are you could decrease the respiratory rate. So we know that long, slow, deep breaths get flow further down into the airways. So slow flow goes low. So if you have a slower respiratory rate, you can have a longer inspiratory time to really target that ventilation up into that right upper side. And then you can also combine this with those manual techniques that I was talking to you about before. So you might have a big breath going in and then your manual techniques of your, of your vibrations to help move those secretions. You might do a few breaths like that and then a suction with a manual assisted cough or further vibrations to really help mobilize those secretions. And what we're finding is you often need to do multiple, multiple cycles of this. So as well as um, our positioning, our manual techniques and our ventilator hyperinflation, suction is something that we're also going to need to do with these patients. Ideally, because this patient is intubated and ventilated, we should be using a closed circuit suction. So um, if the patient hasn't got a closed circuit suction circuit already attached and those are available to you, I would strongly strongly, strongly recommend that it gets switched to a closed circuit. Closed circuit means that there is less aerosol generating risk um, because you're not disconnecting the patient from the ventilator. Um, also, it is um, safer for the patient because you're not disconnecting them again from that ventilator, so you're not getting any loss of oxygen or ventilation. However, I do know that in some places, closed circuit suction might not be available. So you're going to need your sterile gloves for your open technique. As I said before, for your full PPE, going to need your suction catheters and you might need a sputum trap um, if we're wanting to get a sample. Uh, sputum samples are the best method of um, checking for the microbiology that might be going on if the patient has got a ventilator associated pneumonia, but also they are the best way of getting COVID-19 um, results back. So quite often we get asked to provide sputum samples for patients if they want to retest them for their COVID-19 status. So um, in order for your preparation for um, your patient is just 
is to wash your hands and don appropriate PPE and um, explain the procedure to the patient and the staff that are around you. Ensure you've got additional staff presence. You might want your physio colleagues because you might be doing your, your shakes and your VHI at the same time. And you're probably going to need your nursing staff as well because you might need boluses of sedation or the blood pressure might drop. Um, or you might want somebody to hold the T tube as well if, if it's a bit precarious and you're being quite I don't want to say aggressive, but quite firm with your shakes. Um, so make sure you've got, you know, the appropriate people around. Always document your baseline observations. And that goes for all of the things that I've just talked about as well. We want to make sure we're recording where the patient was before we treat them and, and after. And you might, again, need to pre-oxygenate these patients if required. So you might need to give them a little bit of increased oxygen because you are, you know, whilst you're suctioning, they're not getting the same ventilation um, happening. So you might need to pre-oxygenate them. And you can find, again, that these patients with COVID-19 have been found to desaturate quite spectacularly. So in order to prevent that, it's probably worth pre-oxygenating these patients. And then you want to make sure that your suction pressure is the, at the right level, up to 25 kilopascals. So um, your technique for suctioning, you're going to connect your catheter, um, or you might, if it's a closed circuit suction, connecting the um, suction tubing to the catheter. You're going to don your sterile glove if you're doing your open technique, and that needs to be a sterile technique. You insert your suction catheter into the endotracheal tube until resistance is felt or the patient coughs. As our case study patient is on atricurium and propofol, you probably wouldn't be expecting this patient to cough. However, some patients do cough with paralyzing agents on. It's not an absolute no, but just be aware that that is unlikely. So it's going to be more likely that you're going to feel that resistance, which is hopefully the carina. You're going to pull back by a centimeter and then apply your suction with your thumb and slowly withdraw the suction catheter. You might also want to be combining this suction with your manual technique. So as we said before, getting one of your colleagues or you might be getting the nurse and staff to suction for you while you apply those shakes to the patient's chest or a manual assisted cough. Because if the patient isn't coughing, we need to move those secretions up towards the um, the ET tube and the, the main airways to be able to suck them out with the suction. So you can see here the process of the suction catheter moving down um, into the ET tube. The same process occurs for a patient with a tracheostomy, um, so just bear that in mind as well. And then after you've, you've suctioned your patient, you should always fully reassess. So have another listen, look at the, the, the patient's OBS, their SATs, um, their heart rate, their blood pressure, um, and also have a look at the ventilator as well, check their tidal volumes. Um, and check everything's okay from that point of view. One thing that can happen with suction um, is patients, because you're hitting the carina, they can drop their blood pressure. Um, so if somebody is cardiovascularly unstable, just be aware of that. And you might not want to go quite as far down with your suction catheter. So just be aware of that. Um, also, um, in patients that have got low platelets or um, have been bleeding, again, you might want to take a lot of caution with, with suctioning. Um, that goes for your manual techniques as well because we wouldn't want to cause any more trauma and um, also with your suctioning and um, just making sure that when you're passing your suction catheter down you go down as quickly as possible because you want to be able to withdraw nice and slowly you have about 10 seconds to perform a suction so you want to get down there as quick as possible to be able to withdraw nice and nice and slowly to hopefully clear those secretions so just some key points from that, it's all about timing. So trying to time this as best we can with the nursing staff um, and with our other physiotherapy colleagues potentially as well. It's about coordinating those cares. So can we do this at the right time? You know, when the nurses are due to turn and reposition the patients, we can optimise that as best we can. Also, you know, can we think about things like a sedation hold might be a good time to potentially treat the patient if that means they're going to be coughing, you're going to get the most benefit then. Risk versus benefits as well for these patients, you know, if they're going to desaturate and not tolerate physiotherapy very well, that needs to be taken into account. But also the risks of those tubes blocking is very, very high. So you need to be doing 
doing a very detailed assessment to identify if there's definitely secretions there that need to be cleared. And as always, teamwork is absolute key. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in the next section where we're going to talk about prone, prone in ventilated patients. So I'm um, going to go through all of the stages that we go through to prone a ventilated patient. So this just gives you a little um, snapshot of the processes that we go through to prone a ventilated patient. So proning is the process of turning a patient onto their front um, to optimise their ventilation to their dorsal areas of their lungs. So you're getting preferential ventilation to those basal um, areas to hopefully improve gas exchange and improve their oxygenation. This is a technique that's used very commonly in patients with ARDS. Um, and we are finding with COVID-19 patients that ARDS is um, quite common and patients usually, hopefully, respond quite well to pronin, but also that they need pronin often on multiple occasions. So they might be proned, unproned, reproned on multiple, multiple occasions. As a result of that, some places in the UK during our first wave, and also probably are starting to look at this in our second wave, decided to set up proning teams. So you would have a team that would go around and prone and unprone all of these patients as, as required. Okay, so um, who, who are we going to prone? So the patients we're going to prone are those with moderate to severe ARDS. They're usually relatively early in the course of disease. You don't tend to find that proning works later on in the course of disease, but that isn't to say it shouldn't be tried. You should maintain patients in prone for 16 to 18 hours at a time. There was a very large French study done quite a few years ago now that demonstrated a significant improvement in mortality in these patients if they were left prone for that amount of time. You want to combine it with your protective ventilation strategies, which I'm sure you talked about a little bit before, and it might be combined with moderate to high peak levels. Um, the evidence is, you know, as has shown that we might not need as high le PEEP levels as we thought we would in these patients, but that isn't to say you might not see it. These patients are sedated and paralysed and um, usually will have been paralysed before proning because of ventilator dyssynchrony. So these patients fighting against the ventilator create swings in pressure in tidal volume. And we know that that is what damages those alveoli and leads to this cyclical effect of ARDS. And we know that this may need to be repeated multiple times, as I said. So the benefits of prone in patients is improved oxygenation, improving the respiratory mechanics, improving BQ matching, and decreasing that ventilator-associated lung injury, as well as from our point of view as physios, is actually a really good secretion drainage position as well. So, I mean, I have actually, on my unit, we have prone to people for secretion management sometimes, and it can work really well, but that's usually a sort of lucky side benefit. So as I said, when, when these patients have ARDS and they're, they're laid supine, what tends to happen is that preferential ventilation goes to the what they call the baby lungs, so the, the sort of upper areas, and they just get stretched and stretched and stretched, and that's what causes the damage. When you prone somebody, that, that ventilation preferentially goes to those basal and dorsal areas of the, of the lungs, so that's uh, why we use this. There are some contraindications. These are absolute contraindications. Spinal instability. Um, um, open chest post-operatively or due to trauma. Apologies for the typo there. Um, if they have recently had cardiac surgery and also if they are centrally cannulated for ECMO or BIVAD support. There are quite a few relative um, risks or uh, cautions, if you like, but um, when a patient is an extremist and you're really needing to improve their ventilation, you'll often find that you kind of just do this anyway. So I haven't put those on the slides. But if you want to read any more about this, the ARDSnet group have published loads of stuff about that. I'm sure that was mentioned in your previous um, talk as well. OK, so what do we need to think about before we prone somebody. So we need to consider those contraindications. We need to think about the risks versus the benefits. It needs to be discussed, obviously, with a consultant and the nurse in charge on the unit. We need to inform the patient 
I've, if the patient is awake enough to have that conversation, which it's relatively unlikely, um, and also discuss it with their family. Obviously, discussions with families are much, much more difficult in these current times. We've recently just had visiting stopped again in our trust. So it relies on face um, FaceTime or video calls like Zoom um, or telephone conversations. So it can be challenging, but needs to be done. We need to ensure we've got uh, the adequate staffing. So you need five members of staff to prone somebody. And one of those members of staff needs to be able to manage the airway. And that might be that you have a proning team where you work. And that has worked really well in some centres in the UK. We need to make sure that any outstanding procedures or investigations have been done before the patient is proned. So, for example, if they need a vas cath for CVVH or they need a new arterial line or they need a new central line, it's really difficult to get those in place when a patient is prone. So it's really important to get those in place before we prone the patient. Also need to be aware of local proning policies. Um, our trust has one and we, do, we follow that. So just be aware if there's anything different in your proning policies. Um, and then equipment that we need. So a pressure relieving mattress and an adjustable bed. Um, the airway trolley for just in case. You should have a closed circuit suction connected if that's available. You need to have your ET tube newly and freshly taped so it's nice and secure. You want to have something to protect their eyes that could be um, gel or ointment or pads and um, it could be wet gauze. You need slide sheets, you need two clean bed sheets, three to five pillows and um, new ECG electrodes because when you're prone in somebody you take them off and reapply them to the back. So as I said, um, we've gone over most of this, but you need five members of staff, usually two either side and one on the airway, and that should be somebody that's airway trained. You need to secure your lines, make sure they're all in the right position. You need to discontinue the feed. Um, you might need to optimise their cardiovascular stability potentially as well. And any lines that need to be done need to be in. The eyes need to be cleaned and then lubricated, taped, gel pads, gore, wet gauze. Everywhere does this slightly differently, but just make sure the eyes are looked after. The difficult airway trolley should be around for in case of any emergencies. ET tubes should be secured and noted its position at the lips. You might want to suction before you prone them. You might want to consider pre-oxygenating the patients and which side the ventilator is on. So you're usually prone towards the ventilator. So I'll show you that in a second. So from your lines and stuff, you need to consider moving all of those potentially to that to that side. And the patient needs to be adequately sedated and paralysed. So the first step, you just need to all communicate about who is going to do what um, and what way you're going to turn the patient. Um, and as long as everybody knows their role and how this is we're going to work, then that's the best thing to do. Usually the person on the airway is the person leading the whole procedure. So go with what they say. So first of all, you're going to lie the patient flat and somebody is going to secure that ET tube. Then what we do is wrap the patient. So you have a clean sheet underneath them and a clean sheet on top. And then we call it Cornish pastian. You roll really tightly those sides in towards the patient. Well, you need to have placed pillows over their chest and their pelvis. You'll then do a horizontal move. So move to the side and then a lateral turn. So you come up and then you swap your hands over and you move the patient onto their front. There are some really good videos available online of, of this procedure as well. So that they can be really useful to watch if you're not familiar with how this works. Um, so as you can see, the, the people from this top have got their hands on top and then they've now moved them to the bottom and they're gonna pull the patient through. So once the patient is positioned, so you can see the pillars there underneath their chest and the pelvis, you want to place the patient into this, what we call the swim position. So the arm they're facing is up at 80 degrees shoulder flexion and 90 degrees elbow flexion, and their other arm is down at their side. And this should be alternated every two to three hours. But you need, again, there's sufficient amount of staff and expertise to do this safely. And then just being aware of pressure care. So as we said, eyes, ears, skin, ET tube and lines and things, just before you leave the patient, make sure that there is nothing, you know, pressing on anywhere um, that might cause any damage because you do find that patients do get severe, severe damage if something has been left on their skin when they're in a prone position.
Okay, so I think I'm just about on time, just about right, hopefully. So um, key learning points from this. So just remembering that your COVID-19 patients, ventilator patients can have sputum retention. Respiratory physiotherapy assessment is really beneficial. So make sure you do a thorough assessment and then think about your techniques of positioning, manual techniques, which might be fibs or manual assisted cough, ventilator hyperinflation, and also suction as well. Make sure you communicate and work with your MDT. So try and time and collaborate and optimise when we're doing these things. Prone ventilation in combination with protective lung ventilation can improve VQ matching and oxygenation. And if they're a responder, as we call them, to proning, they may need to be proned on multiple occasions. So thank you for listening. I hope that has been useful and I'll just hand back over to Rachel um, and see if there's any questions. Hi Alex, thanks so much. That talk was brilliant. So we do have time for a quick question. Um, so apart from vibrations and assisted cough, are there ever any other manual techniques that you'd use? I think for example, percussion. Okay, so I personally don't use percussion in adults. Um, I, their chest walls are very, very stiff um, and I personally haven't found it's been massively effective. But I do know there are physiotherapists out there that do use a lot of percussion with these pa with patients. Um, it works really well in your, your children with, you know, pliable chest walls and tend to find it works much better with them. In those in, with more restricted chest walls, you don't tend to find it works as well. So I tend to use vibrations and manual assisted cough in these patients. I don't know about you, Rachel. Yeah, that's definitely our experience. But I, I think it's an adjunct in some other countries you use percussion a lot. Like we're seeing that a lot in, yeah. in Gaza as well. Um, so I, it's in your toolbox I think yeah. what you really need to be mindful of is these patients have really poor lung compliance they have really difficult stiff lungs um, so anything you're doing around the chest wall potentially could be a bit more detrimental than usual yeah um, in terms of the vibrations it can be a lot more controlled and the, like you said they're at the end of expiration so they're more likely to um, have an effect on secretion mobilization but again there's very little evidence for any of this type yeah. of stuff um, it's just what works for you so our advice is sometimes especially with pronin the secretions are so palpable they're so palpable especially when you've you know reproned uh, or supinated so yeah I think I would agree with that but it's certainly something that would we would we sit here and say no it's definitely yeah not. no definitely so not. we wouldn't say that and um, it would definitely be on a case case and it's in the toolbox if you like yeah okay thank you very much now Alex has just mentioned she's on Twitter there's I've got lots of comments it was very comprehensive there's no questions left um <laughs> the, most, the, the big thing is for us in the UK, like physiotherapy has been so effective, physiotherapy techniques combined with proning, reproning, um, lots and lots of hands on physio needed for these patients. And we massively underestimated that in the beginning yeah. of the first wave. We massively underestimated how much we would need to do in critical care. Um, and that was probably because of the patient um, you know, experience we've seen from the Italian cohort and the Chinese um, um, cohort as well. But what I would say is that our physio respiratory physiotherapy and ICU is very different. We have a different setup here. So we're very engaged and I know that they are as well across Africa. So um, my cohort today has been pulled onto the COVID ward and the critical care ward this morning because um, they're very much needed there. So yes, um, thank you so much for your talk. Please reach yeah, out to you. Alex. We're going to have a very short break now, so we'll be back at 20 past, so in five minutes. So grab yourself a five-minute break, and um, we will go offline.